We've been uh, talking for the past several weeks about this uh, idea in Scripture called problem to promise, how God takes us through our problem into His promise. And I believe God's got a good promise for you today, don't you? I believe He does. How many have uh, faced a problem? How many are facing a problem right now? Something going on in your life, got a problem? How many have never had a problem before? Raise your hand. Okay, wow. All right, you will. Don't worry. Um, Don't worry. In fact, I'll make sure you have one by the time you leave church. Okay, I just feel like that's my ministry for you that raised your hand. By the time you leave here, you will have a problem. I will remind you of it. We've been talking about this guy in the Bible. His name's Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob. I want to give you a little recap. And Jacob and uh, that family line are the ones that when God introduced himself, he would say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is kind of an important family line right here. Joseph was the son of Jacob. And through this, uh, Jacob was uh, also known in the Bible as Israel and as the father of the people of Israel. In fact, Joseph's two sons would actually be two of the tribes of Israel uh, throughout Scripture. And you'll read that as you read through the Old Testament. You should be reading your Bibles. That's a good thing. And uh, Joseph's about 17 when we pick up his story in Genesis chapter 37. And he was a young man following the Lord. And the Lord had given him a dream that he was going to be a leader. And, not, and his leader would actually cause his family to come in and submit to his leadership. And God was going to do a great work through him. Well, that didn't set well with some of the family. In fact, some of the brothers, uh, actually all of them, didn't like that. And so they didn't like that his father loved him, loved Joseph. They didn't like that father, their father loved Joseph and gave him a nice coat and uh, was kind of treating him especially because he was living a, a life of integrity and a life of moral goodness and following after his father's commands. Well, we left him off last week in the story in Genesis 37. He was on his way to visit his brothers and they were shepherding their sheep and to give a good report. And his brothers saw him coming and they said, here comes the dreamer, let's kill him. Good brothers, right? Great family reunion. We talked about that last week and how we we deal with the problem of enemies. Joseph's brothers were his enemies, even though Joseph wasn't their enemy, but they had become so bitter that they became enemies. Well, as the story goes on, Reuben, the oldest, stepped up and said, hey, let's not kill him. Let's let's actually just throw him into this little pit here, and we'll, we'll mess around with him a little bit, pull a little brotherly prank with the intent to give him back to his father. Well, he decided to, you know, run to 7-Eleven. And when he came back, the rest of the brothers sold Joseph into slavery. How many want brothers like that? Nobody. So they sold him into slavery, and uh, they didn't kill him, but he's in slavery, and he's, uh, he's got a problem now that he is a slave. I don't know about you, but I've been noticing this thread through Joseph's life. He kind of goes from one problem to another. Seems to have always something come up in his life. It's just... Man, and I got to think that as he's on his way from Canaan to Egypt as a slave, he's thinking to himself, why does it always have to be me? Have you ever thought that about yourself? You're like, you just go from one problem to another and you think, oh man, I'm just a life full of problems. It's always one after another and we just kind of just all the time, we're just thinking about our problem. Anybody ever been in that boat? You feel like, man, it's just always bad stuff. Some years ago... uh, about year number five in our church, uh, I was working full-time as a general contractor. Work was terrible, and uh, I was at the beach, our beach baptism, one of our big days of the year as a church. I was at the beach, and we were, uh, I was playing catch with one of our deacons who was just, he's really a bully to me, and he's pushing me around all the time. Well, he threw the football really hard and uh, on purpose trying to injure me, and uh, it, it hit my finger, and it jammed it. And, and, you know, I shook it off, and I turned my head. I said, yeah, good pass, you know. I didn't want him to see the tears coming down my face. Well, you know, we played catch, and I was like, man, that kind of hurts a little bit. Well, the next day, my finger had, had swollen up so bad, I actually told my wife, I said, I think I broke my finger. And uh, she said, well, you better go to the doctor. So I went to a friend of ours who was a doctor, and they, uh, she did an X-ray, and it turned out I had a small fracture. But beyond that, I didn't know, but I had a, I had a tumor growing in my, in this, inside of my bone. And they would have never found it had I not uh, jammed my finger. Well, that progressed to surgeries, and they had to graft bone in there and remove it because it was growing, and it was, gonna, it was actually eventually going to burst my bone. And it was all kind of fun stuff. Well, long story short, I had to be in a cast and, and all this stuff, and I couldn't work. Work was already terrible, and I couldn't work because I needed my hands to work. And uh, the church, you know, I wasn't full-time pastor. I was working uh, whatever jobs I could pick up. Well, I had to go on disability, and that was fun. Well, I've been, I've been self-employed 
basically my entire life. And so my disability was $189-ish, something about that, like every two weeks. That's how much money I got paid on disability. Isn't that awesome? I was, I was a high roller. I had so many pennies, I can't even tell you. I would cash those checks in pennies to make me feel better about myself. Well, you know, we had to have, uh, you know, disability, and then we went in, and we, got, we qualified for food stamps, and, and that was, we were embarrassed about that. I don't know why, thinking back, it's kind of lame situation where you kind of need that. And so we did that, and we were able to buy groceries, and, and I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, this is just one problem after another, and I just felt like, man, my life is just going to be full of problems. It was a really hard time for us. Anybody been through something like that? You just kind of, man, this is tough. This is brutal. This is no fun. God, I thought life was supposed to be fun. Where's the fun factor, God? Well, life was not fun. And let me just tell you, just for a guy who works with his hands, to to lose one in a cast, I was going nuts. Nuts. It affected my bowling and my golf, all the things that are, all those ministries that I was working on. It was really, really tough. But you know Thinking about that and thinking about this, this idea that Joseph was kind of going from one problem to another, and I was going from one problem to another, and you've gone from one problem to another, is it brings up a very important and a very specific problem we all face. And to be honest, we're all going to face again. And that's this. It's the problem of a problem perspective. Take out your notes and follow along today. It's the problem of a problem perspective. In other words, we get so focused on the problem All I can think about and all I can see is the problem. Anybody been there, done that? And we just, that's all we can think about. That's all we talk about. That's all we post about. That's all we write about. That's all all we pray about. That's all we consider. And we're just like problem, problem, problem. And we think about it. And and then we get into this lamenting status and this lamenting attitude where we're kind of like, oh, God, why is it always me? It's like traffic in Temecula. Jesus needs to do a miracle with the traffic in Temecula. But you know how, what I'm talking about? When you're in the lane, you're like, okay, I got, this lane seems to be moving a little faster, so I'm going to get over there, and then it goes slow. And then you're like, okay, fine. And then you get back there, and you're like, why, God, are you just out to get me? I mean, every time I move, the lane was moving until I got there, and then now it's going slow, and now I've just got, it's always me, God. You've always got your hand against me. Problem perspective. All I think about is the wrong that's going on in my life and and the bad that's going on in my life. And all I can see is my problem and never the promise. I've got to think that when Joseph was on that little wagon ride or camel ride or whatever he's on, on his way to Egypt, he had to have a little bit of time of maybe a little depression, a little felt like he was alone, a little bit of like, oh my gosh, this is just, well, okay, I guess I'm just going to be a slave the rest of my life. That's my lot in life, and that's all I'm ever going to be. I'm always just going to be the guy stuck in traffic. I'm always going to be the guy who's broke. I'm always going to be the guy who's... You guys fill it out. We get like that sometimes, don't we, huh? All I can think about is the problem. You just turn on the news. That's all they can think about is the problem. The bad situation, the bad circumstance. But as we pick up the story with Joseph, what we're going to learn is something that I believe for you will be life-changing. As we think of the problem and we look to the promise, God does a miracle in Joseph's life, even in the problem. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to Genesis chapter 39, and we're going to read the first six verses. And this is what, what it says. Now, Joseph's been sold into slavery by his brothers, and he's on his way. And it says, now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, 
he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I wasn't going to preach about this passage. But as I started researching and I started studying and I started praying, I, I read these first six verses and I said, those six verses are a miracle. And I want you to believe and I want you to know today that as you go through your problem, this can happen to you too. That God can do a miracle in your life. Now, I want you to think about your problem for a second. I wouldn't normally tell you this on a Sunday, but I want you to think about whatever problem you're going through right now, whatever circumstance you're going through right now, whatever's happening in your life right now, I just want you to think about it for a second. And I want you to kind of relate it to what Joseph's going through. Okay, this, this is my slavery. This problem is my slavery. And I, I am a slave to this problem right now because that's what happens in our life. We become a slave to our problem or a slave to our crisis or a slave to our circumstance. Okay, this thing is kind of holding me in bondage right now. And I want you to really think about it because what I'm about to say, I believe, will change your life. Because Joseph had a huge problem. But as we read through the account of his life, God does a miracle, and he can do the same miracle for you. Because I believe that even in your problem, God can make you prosper. Come on, church. That even in your problem, God can make you prosper. Joseph was a slave to this man, Potiphar. But even in his slavery, God made him prosper. That's crazy. That's a miracle. God didn't take away his slavery. You know, a lot of times we pray and we think, okay, God, just take away my problem. Then I'll be happy. That's not how God works sometimes. Sometimes God leaves the problem. Can we just be honest with each other? Sometimes God leaves us in the problem. But that doesn't mean that in the problem, God can't prosper me. Joseph was in the problem of slavery, but God still prospered his work. And God still prospered his hand. And God still prospered his ministry. And God still prospered his influence. Because that's how God works. Even in your problem, God can make you prosper. Turn to your neighbor and say, God can make you prosper. You see, and I think that that's one of the things that God teaches us through, through the story of Joseph is that he says, man, look, I don't want you to get so destitute about your problem. I don't want you to get so discouraged about your problem. I don't want you to get so crazy about your problem that you forget that even in that, I can do a good work. That's one of the reasons why I love the 23rd Psalm. You know, they read the 23rd Psalm at funerals all the time. But I really believe it has more implication for the people that are living. Let's read it together. Psalms 23, 1 through 6. Because this relates to everything Joseph's gone through and how you and I can have the right perspective even in the problem. It starts off with this, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Can we just stop right there? I mean, can that just rock your world for a second? The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I don't need more when I have God in my life. I have all that I need. Come on, church. I've already got what I need. You see, we're always thinking of God, hey, God, you've got to fix my problem, then I'll be happy. God says, no, I am more than enough for you. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I could stop on that verse and pray and close. We could go home right now because that is so rich and so thick, and we miss it every single day of our life. God, I don't care what happens in my business today. I don't care what happens in my marriage today because I know you got me, and I've got all that I need in you because you're my shepherd. And I stopped freaking out about my problem because God can prosper me even in my problem. Why? Because I've got all I need in him. You see, sometimes we spend so much time freaking out, we miss out on the fact that God is preparing a feast. Let's continue to read the verse. It says, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. This is you guys. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast before me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. 
I should do a whole series on this pa- passage. Just rock your world. I want you to think about this for a second. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need, okay? <laughs> I just, that's craziness. Here I am, freaking out. Ah, that's my freak out face. Ah, what am I going to do? I'm only making a little money. How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the rent? Ah, my marriage is on the rocks. Ah, I might get a divorce. Ah, my physical body is failing. Ah. Now, those are all real problems. But sometimes I think that's what we sound like to God. Here's me. Here's you. Ah, cry. Ah, Facebook. Everybody doesn't know how bad my life is. Ah. Here's God. Do you want white or wheat toast? Do you, how do you like your burger? Do you want cheese? Ah! Hey, I'm, I'm preparing a feast over here for you. In the presence of your problem. Hey, if you just would come over here and, and we'll eat together. And, don't worry about this, bro. You ever notice how God never freaks out? He's never like, oh my gosh, Zach, what are we going to do now? I don't even know. This problem's too big for me. Jesus, you're out for me. I'm in freak out and God's preparing a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. In the center of my problem, God's like, we got this. We got it. Stop freaking out. That's so huge, church. It's so rich. It's where we hold our our mind and our thoughts in obedience to Christ. That he's never going to let, he's never going to let me go. He's never going to let me down because you are good. You are good. Oh God, you're good. I got to know that the Bible's telling me the truth. And the example of Joseph's life is speaking the truth that even in my problem, when my life is bad and the enemies are at the walls, God's still good. And he still works goodness in my life, even in the problem, even in the panic, even like, what am I going to do now? Because sometimes in the problem, we forget that God has already prepared the provision. You see, if I'm going to get through my problem, I have to look for God's provision. I'm in freak-out mode, ah! and then God's over here. I'm going to make some provisions for us. We're going to have a picnic. That's not quite what I was thinking, God. I know, but my plans are better than yours. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. In fact, Zach, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher than yours. You little peon, I got it covered. I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's got it figured out. You see, but I have to remember in the problem, God's already got the provision. I mean, you think in your life right now, you think what's going on in your life right now, because you're so focused on the problem that you don't remember the provision or you don't think about the provision. I honestly look back to that time of having that that tumor in my hand and having the surgery and and, and, and going through that and and just being, I mean, dirt broke. I, I mean, I was doing all kinds of anything I could do to get... You know, everything short of sin I was doing to try and make a dollar. And I honestly look back in that time in my life, I can't even remember how we did it. Honestly, I can't even, I can't even remember. I don't even know how it's possible. I look back and I think to myself, I don't even, I don't even know. And God's like, (laughs) that was me. Because God's got the provision. And you know, sometimes we get so focused on that that we forget, hey, oh, hey, remember that time you went through that? Remember I was there? So guess what? I'll be here for this one too. Because he's never going to let us go. You see Psalms 23, 5. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessings. So you know what that means? Think about it in Joseph's life. Joseph's a slave in Egypt. I don't know about you, but I guess that's not probably not very fun to be a slave. You got to do everything you're told. You don't get any pay. You just got all these problems and and you don't have any freedom. You're a slave. 
And so in the, in the process of being a slave, I got I to gotta know that Joseph said, God, you're my shepherd. I have all that I need, and you are my greatest blessing, not my stuff. And in being my greatest blessing, I know in this process, you are going to be my provision in the problem, because even in my problem, you can make me prosper. And in that concept, in that spirit, I know that because of you, not because of my stuff, my cup overflows with blessing. You anoint my head with oil. The Holy Spirit comes on me. And even in my problem, I rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because my cup overflows with blessing. Why? Just because I have Jesus in my life. Not because of the last thing I ordered on Amazon Prime. You see, we got this kind of like happiness mentality where it's like, okay, I'll be happy if. I'll be joyful if. I'll be happy if I get married. Once I get married, I'll finally be happy. Once I get my new house, I'll, I found, once I get that promotion, I'll finally be happy. Once I get, I'll be happy. Once I do, you know, and then whatever you want. Listen, my joy is in the Lord. That's where it has to be rooted. Otherwise, it's just circumstantial. And if it's just circumstantial, your joy is going to fail every time. So I got to know that there was some demeanor in Joseph's life as he's going through sl- slavery that it, took, that it took the people around him to stand up and, and take notice that something's going on with this guy's life. Something's different is happening here. Because he didn't find his joy, he didn't find his fulfillment in the circumstance that he found it in the Lord. And that's where you and I find it because our cup overflows with blessings. You ever heard the, the, the phrase, the saying says, you know, just, you just got to count your blessings, right? Somebody says it to you right when you're going through a problem, you're like, I'm going to beat you with my blessings if you don't be quiet right now. We're like, you always pick the worst time to tell me to be happy. Now's not the time. You know, and the veins are popping out of my eyes. But it's really true. You know, sometimes in life, no, we, we're so busy counting our problems, we forget to look at the blessing. I, I, I guarantee you that if you went home today and you sat down and you just wrote down five or ten things, and I think actually it's one of your challenges this week, one of your next steps, you're going to go down and you're going to say, hey, how is God blessing you in your life right now? What is it? What way? How about the fact that you're alive? That you get to hear me preach today. Well, that should maybe be one, and then you're alive. I'm sure you can think of some blessings that God's doing in your life and not focus on the negatives because God blesses you and God works in your life. See, and we learn from Psalms 23 that the same thing that God did for Joseph is this, is that God promises to pursue you with goodness and love all of your life. When Joseph was sold into slavery, God didn't abandon him. God didn't say, hey, I'm finished with you. That's it, toast, I'm done. I'm just gonna stand back and see what happens. God doesn't work that way. The Bible says that God pursues us with goodness and love all of our life. And if you will let him, he will pursue you with goodness and with love all of your life. And if you would take a minute And you would just begin to focus on the promise of God that God's always going to be with you and he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. And even in the problem, he can make you prosper. That if I begin to have that focus, I say, God, I receive your goodness and your love in my life right now in Jesus' name. And I say, God, have your way in my life. He might not fix my problem. That's a tough truth. Did you know that? God might not fix your problem. I don't even like saying that but he can prosper you in the problem. He can bring it about for good because that's how he rolls. And I believe that God can bring it about for good in your life. Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and a failing love pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Now we're thinking about prosperity here. I want, I want you to understand prosperity because the world has a definition and a mindset. We say prosperity is almost Americanized. Okay, well, if I have enough money and I'm doing good and my portfolio is nice and I've got enough in savings, you know, and I'm, I don't have to be afraid because I've got a savings account and I'm good, you know, then, then that's prosperity. That has nothing to do with prosperity. God might prosper you in that way for his good purpose, not for your comfortable living style. God prospers us for his good purpose, 
Not so that we can have more stuff and have a more plush American life. That's not a popular thing to say. I know that. But it's true. But there's a couple things that you should know about prosperity. Prosperity doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. Okay? And we have to be very careful with this one because we, we have this mindset sometimes where we think prosperity comes from me. Oh, having a more successful job or having another, you know, this or that, or, or hey, if I just move these things around, or if I do this, and all of a sudden, that's our mindset of prosperity. And then all of a sudden, prosperity becomes something that we've earned ourselves or that we've done by our own power. Joseph's prosperity, even in the slavery, came because the Bible says, and the Lord was with him and caused Joseph to prosper in everything he did. It didn't say Joseph prospered because he was a great CEO of the organization. Joseph prospered because the Lord was with him in everything he did. Totally different mindset than the world. And when God is with you and he makes you prosper, that's a whole other world altogether. That's a whole other set of goodness. And that has to come from changing the way that we think about prosperity. It doesn't come from you. It comes from the Lord. And can you just have that mindset and that heart and that prayer says, God, I'm, I'm just so thankful for the prosperity that you've given me and the things that you've given me in my life and how it works in my life because the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord prospered Joseph. Joseph didn't prosper Joseph. The next thing we learn about prosperity is this, is that your prosperity is going to look different than someone else's prosperity. Some people, God prospers financially. Others, he doesn't. You know, we see this all the time in business world or whatever. Say, hey, well, okay, if, I, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into real estate, you know, and, and if you're in real estate, I'm, I'm not trying to, my, my brother's in real estate for years and years and years, but we get this mindset. I'm going to get into real estate, and I'm going to make a million dollars, and if I don't sell this many houses like this guy sold this many houses, well, then I guess I'm not as prosperous as him, and then I feel less than. But maybe God didn't call you to prosper that way. Maybe he's going to prosper you another way. If God was going to prosper us all the same way, we would all be buff, good-looking, and rich. But clearly, we're not. Now turn to your neighbor and say you're good-looking. You see, you see how skewed our mind is, though? God does not prosper us all the same way. Yours is going to look different than somebody else's. Look, I know lots of people with crazy amounts of money with a terrible family. The Bible actually says, woe to the rich. So we have to not think in an American platform where we think, oh, that's my, that's my exclamation point on my prosperity is that my, my success in stuff and things and finances is what God... No, it's going to look different. Now, does that mean that uh, I'm not prosperous? Yeah, I just, we, Laura and I were just talking the other day that, you know, um, she was lamenting to me. You know, she's watching online. Hi, honey. Uh, she was lamenting to me how, you know, we've been together now for, you know, almost a quarter of a century. We've been married for 22 years. We've been together now for almost a quarter, quarter of a century. She's like, oh, look how much I've been through. And she wasn't. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but now, now think about it. God has blessed me with a great marriage and a great wife. Does that mean that because your marriage failed and you ended in divorce that God's not prospering you? No. You see how it's not circumstantial? God works out in our problem His blessing according to His good purpose. So don't compare your prosperity to someone else's. You're just going to be depressed. But if the Lord is all you need because He's your shepherd, I prosper according to His good design and His plan for my life. So God's prosperity is going to look different. Yours, your, yours is going to look different than other people's. See, prosperity is really defined as God's blessing. Everybody say God's blessing. Yes, God's blessing. And the, the, the next thing we learn about prosperity is this. Is God's blessing in your life is a witness to the world. Everybody say witness. Genesis 39, the story of Joseph again. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. And the, uh, the blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had to, in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except for where he was going to order takeout. That was it. I just got it all. That's all. Now, think about this for a second. 
Joseph went into his problem, slavery, probably a little frustrated. But somewhere along the line, he got over it. And he said, I'm going to do this as unto the Lord. With the Lord as my helper and the Lord as my shepherd, I have all that I need. And God is the one who's going to prosper me. And he began to work like a godly man. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit was on him so that he began to do things that no one else was doing. And God blessed the work of his hand so that someone who was not part of the family of God took notice of the hand of God in his life and began to say, I want that man close to me. And I want that man overseeing the things that I need to have overseen because God's hand is on him. And all of a sudden, Joseph began, and you'll see later on, he not only became a witness to Potiphar, he became a witness to the whole land of Egypt. Because even in his problem, God made him prosper. You see, when you begin to have a mindset of God's good blessing in your life, even in the problem, people outside the family of God and inside the family of God look at you and the way you're handling it with integrity and with the anointing of God in your life, and they say, I want more of that. And you say, well, let me tell you how to get it. And they say, how? And you say, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. And my problem doesn't define me. It's a witness to the world. Do you know that? When you go through your problem, how you handle it and how you deal with it is a witness to the world. So be a good one. Be a good one. Proverbs 4.18 says this, The path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining even brighter and brighter till the full light of day. You see, Joseph just began to, you're going to see through the process of his life in the weeks to come. As he began to go through problem after problem after problem, God worked in his life and he began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And because of him, millions of people were saved. You see, God can work through your problem and he can bring prosperity out of your problem, his blessing, even in your circumstance. And I believe that for you.